All right. So um, I do want to thank everyone for being here today. I, I appreciate uh, your patience uh, through our technical issues. We are grateful that you've all joined us for this community conversation about the Convention Center project. Our focus today is to gather public input on the future of this project. And everybody knows COVID-19 pandemic has changed our world and it's appropriate that we have delayed working on this project. We haven't really even uh, talked much about it um, as our focus is turned to protecting the health of our community and ensuring our community's economic vitality into the future. So just a clarifying point, today's discussion is not about the food and beverage tax, the 1% tax on prepared food, restaurant, and bar purchases. The portion of the tax which is collected in the city is dedicated to supporting the Convention Center project. However, the decision to implement the food and beverage tax is the purview of the county council. It is not uh, within our purview. So uh, we're, our focus today is really just on the Convention Center project itself. I know that they're connected with the tax, but we're not here to talk about the tax. Uh, we are curious about the public's perception on the project. We could try to guess what the community's view of the project, uh, if, if the community's view has changed, uh, but we thought it would be best to hear from the community directly and to hear where people stand instead of guessing where people are. Uh, this is not a structured meeting, uh, but our goal is to have more of a conversation and it looks like a nice group for a conversation. Um, so we may ask you a follow-up question. You can always say, you know, no, no response or you don't have to respond to any of our follow-up questions. But um, that is our goal today is just to hear from you and uh, to see where everybody's at. Uh, so today we have present um, myself, uh, Commissioner Jones and Commissioner Giffins. Uh, also on this uh, panel that you'll see uh, is Angie Purdy. Now Angie Purdy is our uh, commissioner's administrator and she has kindly agreed to take notes live. So be kind and gentle to her, uh, but we appreciate uh, Ms. Purdy joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over first um, to uh, Commissioner Jones, and then I'll have a couple things to say, and then we'll get right into it. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, I have a timeline of what has brought us to where we are now. Um, in 1977, the innkeeper's tax was approved by the Monroe County Council. In 1986, a division of Cook, CFC, purchased an auto dealership from the city of Bloomington in order to hold the site for purchase by Monroe County upon creation of a building corporation. In 1988, Monroe County authorized purchase of the convention center from the CFC and began creation of the infrastructure to create and support the current convention center. In 2012, the current center was upgraded but not expanded. In 2017, the Board of Commissioners established the Convention Center Advisory Commission. A memorandum of understanding signed between the City of Bloomington and Monroe County Government agreeing to work together to renovate and expand the Convention Center. In December, the County Council passed Ordinance 2017-51, adopting the food and beverage tax to fund the Convention Center with a 4-3 vote. In 2018, the Convention Center Steering Committee was established. Another memorandum of understanding was created but never signed. In 2019, the City of Bloomington signed an agreement with the architectural firm Schmidt Associates. Schmidt Associates held a series of public meetings to receive public comment about the expanded convention center. Schmidt Associates and the steering committee recommended the convention center be expanded to the north. Negotiations regarding the draft MOU continued during the next few months and then stalled. The Board of Commissioners recommended that instead of an MOU, the city and county adopt an interlocal agreement to jointly appoint a capital improvement board to oversee the construction and operation of the convention center. 
several work sessions involving elected officials, including the Board of Commissioners, the Mayor, the City Council, and the County Council, were held to work on the remaining decisions that needed to be made to establish an interlocal agreement. In 2020, the last meeting of the combined group of elected officials working on the interlocal agreement was held in February. In March 2020, the worldwide COVID-19 pandemic hit, reducing travel conventions and temporarily stalling convention center negotiations. At that time, the project items that had been agreed upon were renovation of the current convention center, the addition of approximately 60 square feet of expanded exhibition space and a banquet hall, a full service hotel. The items that remained in flux were connections between the components of the project, a parking garage, the site for expansion, there was a recommendation to allow the Capital Improvement Board to determine the best site for expansion and the creation and appointment of a Capital Improvement Board. And that brings us to where we are today. Great, thank you so much. Um, I appreciate uh, having that uh, information in a digest form, it's excellent. Um, on the screen you'll see uh, for those who um, may be watching this later on CAS or those who are here, uh, we do have a um, email set up and I, we apologize that there were some technical difficulties initially, but the emails are coming through now. And um, that is, um, don't know why that went blank, but let's try this again. So that was, um, there we go. So uh, this email was not working uh, earlier, but it is now. Um, so if you see this later on CATS, um, or if you have other comments, you're joining us today and you have other comments, please send us an email at ccr at co.monroe.in.us uh, whenever you would like. We're gonna keep that open through the end of 2020, uh, through the end of the year. So please uh, avail yourself of that. So, um, just a couple notes. We, we have a few polls that we organized. Um, and um, I'm going to have uh, Ms. Dayton, who has been uh, so helpful with us organizing our meeting, administering our meeting, um, to upload, go ahead and upload. We have two polls to start with. These are just multiple choice polls. And um, we'll just leave these open for 10, 15 minutes and um, feel free to respond to them if you wish. So two different questions, two different polls. And then we're going to, after those are closed, then we're going to go ahead and upload two additional polls with actual written answers, if you prefer. And those will be um, uh, uploaded uh, and remain on screen available for you through the end of our meeting. And again, we're not looking for anything structured today, um, but um, if Ms. Dayton will go ahead and load those poll one and poll two, excellent. Um, and you will see um, that um, the poll one question is um, um, pretty simple. It's about your support for the project and whether it has changed. So we'll leave that on the screen for about 10 minutes and we will go to see if there are any um, folks who are um, attending today uh, who wish to begin um, by making some comment for us? Right, there and is. Okay. Oh, sorry, uh, is one hand raised or three hand Great. raises? Great, thank you. Yep. So just go to the bottom of the screen and raise your hand. I will note we're not going to put a time limit on it, but please be conscious of the fact that the more time you take gives someone else less time to speak. Um, we just want to hear from as many people as possible. So. Uh, we'll go to the first person. If you can give us your name, please. And Angie, you can go ahead and start your screen share for notes. Hi, this is Dave. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay, yeah, this is Dave Warren. Um, I actually wrote a, a comment because I thought I might not be able to make it here, but I'm, uh, I'm here, so I'll just read it. Um, so, and thank you for the opportunity to 
for the public to provide input on this. It's a really good idea. Um, so I'm a big believer in smart capital investments to create needed infrastructure, services, and other amenities to improve the quality of life for current and future residents of our community. But given the large uncertainties presented by the pandemic and perpetually under-addressed needs in Bloomington and Monroe County, I think now would be a good time to reconsider what we do with the tens of millions of dollars this project is expected to cost. Expanding the convention center is intended to benefit local businesses by bringing in more folks from out of town who will then stay in our hotels and spend money at local establishments. While we will eventually exit COVID times, there is now even more uncertainty than there already was about the appeal of this type of economic development strategy, especially after months of people becoming acquainted with the advantages of virtual conferences that include many of the benefits of in-person events without all of the transaction costs of travel, lodging, and time. We will absolutely gather in large numbers again in the near future, but will conferences and other convention center events bounce back at the same rate? Right now, I don't think anyone can answer that question, and so it's a good time to avoid falling victim to the sunk cost fallacy and re-examine re this potential investment. If the ultimate goal of an expanded convention center is to generate more local spending, I'd propose that there are lower cost ways of doing this. We know, for, for instance, that our community does not have enough housing for everyone who wants to live here, leading to many who work in Bloomington living outside the city or even outside the county and commuting in, com contributing to sprawl and congestion and carbon emissions. And because of our housing shortage, those who do live here pay more in rent or monthly housing payments than they otherwise would. A housing-oriented focus instead of a focus on a new convention center would cost considerably less, yet would generate considerable economic benefits, particularly for downtown businesses. More people living downtown means more spending on arts and entertainment and dining, reduced need for cars, improved transit efficiencies. More available housing in the city also addresses a critical need for a Bloomington business community that regularly notes how the lack of more affordable housing or housing period is a key constraint to growth. I don't know what a new plan for this part of Bloomington looks like, and I'm not saying no to any significant capital investment in the area, but that capital investment should pay closer attention to the under-addressed needs of the community, especially on the housing front, and be aimed at making the city a more livable place for all, not just short-term visitors or those with enough income or wealth to enjoy all Bloomington has to offer. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Warren, uh, County Councilor. Um, we appreciate you uh, joining us. So you're asking that we um, re-examine the investment um, and ensure that it's going towards something for economic development. And you mentioned housing and you also mentioned um, transit. Yep, right? um, and, uh, just to point out, I'm not a county councilor, just a planned commission member. I, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's sorry. fine. I, I oh called, my gosh. Uh, it's totally <laughs> it's fine. I once called, it, it's, it's totally fine. I once called, I think, um, Count, county council member Munson, uh, Congresswoman Munson. <laughs> she liked would that. Would actually be great. It would be great. That would be but, good. Uh, oh, so embarrassed. Thank you for correcting okay. me. Plan Commission member uh, Dave Warren, thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate you. All right. Um, all right. So, uh, a next, uh, oh, and before we get to the next comment, uh, just to note the polls can only come one at a time. So, the first poll is up. Please complete it in the next couple minutes, and then you will see poll two. All right, uh, next up is Erin, uh, I believe. Yeah, hi. Hi, thank thanks you for joining us very Aaron. much. Yeah, thank you for letting us uh, give opportunity to give feedback about the future of the Convention Center. Uh, I'm Erin Predmore, the President and CEO of the Chamber of Commerce. Um, Chamber's long supported expanding the Convention Center, as um, I'm sure many of y'all are aware, and we continue to believe that the project would benefit our community pandemic has altered our world. We appreciate that the county commissioners have provided much needed grants to local businesses using, using food and beverage tax revenues for that purpose. Use of those funds while the convention center expansion is on hold. Where we are right now is we see no need to make a decision on the expansion project at this time, however. Um, significant uncertainty about the near-term future as the pandemic has thrown many things into question. We don't have enough information about what the future will hold. We do know Food and beverage tax revenues are increasing again. Um, I did just see that October's were down slightly than 
as those numbers were. Um, so of course, we don't know if that increase will be sustained. We also need to hear from industry experts who'll have a better understanding of how the pandemic's affecting the convention business and what trends they anticipate as it recovers. It's possible, after gathering more information, uh, that the best decision is to change course on this project. However, we don't believe we have enough data at this point to make an informed decision, and we see no reason to act with urgency at this minute. The pandemic has shown us clearly how important it is to diversify our economy and to find ways to decrease our community's over-reliance on Indiana University. An expanded convention center could be a crucial asset to help achieve that goal. As a community, we've invested much time, energy, and resources, um, as we just heard when we got the historical overview, in this project over many, many years. Uh, we hope those efforts won't be wasted uh, by missing an opportunity at this point um, or in the near future to reevaluate this project for the good of the community. Great, thank you. Um, did you and we're, Lee is, I think, in the attendees box and needs to be moved to the panel as she got cut off um, due to technology issues. She may want to go without a camera. Uh, so Michelle, if you could do that. And I will note for everyone that poll number two is up. And Ms. Predmore, if you could stay on for a second, let's see if um, Commissioner Giffins has um, anything to um, add or a question she has. Um, no, just um, thank you for stating the uh, chamber's position on this. Um, it's always good to hear from you. We appreciate that. Yeah, Ms. Predmore, I'm wondering when you say we need to hear from the experts, who are you thinking of? Who would, we, who would the experts be that we need to hear from? Well, I know that during the project, we had a great deal of feasibility studies done and we had people pulled in that were um, aware of what's going on in the community, I mean, in the broad convention community. Um, so that's part of what we need in our, I mean, uh, Mr. Warren's correct that there's a lot of moving parts around the community right now, and there are a lot of needs. One of those feasibility studies talked a lot about the need for people um, in our hotel rooms Monday through Friday, eating at our restaurants and, uh, you know, that kind of economic drivers. And that was very important for our economic health of our community. And then those uh, people coming in that were experts around the convention concepts around the, around the country were able to talk about what our market would be and who would be interested in coming to Bloomington for those types of things. So I, if I remember correctly, that's what that 60,000 um, square foot renovation and expansion was going to be was really answering to that need. We were going to go very green. We we're going to go very sustainable. We had a, a real market identity that, and, and because Bloomington and Monroe County is so amazing, people wanted to come. Uh, this would be a great place. If I was going to be in a, <laughs> in a convention all week, this would be a wonderful place to be. Right. So, um, anyway, I think there's a niche that we kind of, if I remember hearing, remember correctly, I remember hear them saying those types of things. And I just wonder if, if that's still true or, and if it's not, then of course we don't need to move forward. I think we're, our position is just, it's good to look at this and then to kind of evaluate it and sort of see where things come out, especially we've got a new administration coming on board at the federal level. We've got a lot of moving parts. It just, we don't know where this pandemic is going to take us in six months or nine months. We're still so many things are unsure. All right. Um, uh, Commissioner Jones, did you have any follow-up questions or comments? I know you may have missed some of Ms. Predmore's discussion, but Angie put some notes on the screen if that helps. <laughs> I'm afraid I missed all of um, Ms. Ms. Predmore's comments and a whole lot of Mr. Warren's. And for some reason, I'm not seeing Angie's screen. I'm only seeing the timeline. Okay. Um, I don't. <laughs> yeah, she Sorry. has notes up. She had to step away for a second. She has notes up and then the poll is up as well. Poll two is up right now for everyone. So, okay. So we do have notes on okay. that and um, we appreciate the input, Ms. Predmore. Um, Ms. Dayton is um, next person available. Next up is Brian Fox. All right, Mr. Fox, thank you for joining us. Oh, 
I don't hear Mr. Fox. Uh, I sent a request to unmute, but they have to manually hit the unmute button. Okay. Mr. Fox, will you be sure to unmute yourself? Okay. Well, we can come back to um, Mr. Fox if he's having some technical um, issues. Uh, next up is William Ellis. Okay, Mr. Ellis, welcome. Hello there, how you doing? Can everybody hear me okay? We sure can. All right. um, I'm speaking kind of on behalf of not just a Monroe County resident, but also uh, as a member of the Town Council of, of Ellettsville. And this is, again, has been promoted time and time again as a project for Monroe County. But right now, our Ellettsville residents are the ones, I mean, in addition to the Bloomington residents and uh, county residents, but we're paying into something that we don't even know what the status is going to be in four months, six months to a year. So I think there is a sense of urgency uh, for our taxpayers because as we have uncertainty for this project, I think it's more critical we have uncertainty of where their next paycheck's coming from. Are we coming up for another shutdown? We very well might be. And some of these people, the only thing they're gonna be able to depend on uh, is depending on the severity of the shutdown is maybe delivery, possibly going to the store and getting something you know, quick or whatever. And I don't think that us putting a burden on them while we make the decision what we do forward for this is really appropriate at this time. So I really would suggest we pause the entire project, all components of it, and then revisit it later. Because right now, let's say we follow the one of the trains of thoughts and don't make a decision. And then we decide that, you know, a year or two from now, it's not feasible. Well, now we have a bunch of money that has been taken from residents and how do we get that back to them? Uh, I just don't feel that it's appropriate for us to be building something like this or even seriously considering it in the middle of a pandemic when the all the estimates were based on distancing uh, that was pre-COVID. So now you're looking at uh, a convention center to get the same revenue coming into the town that's going to be uh, with social distancing. I don't think that's going away. And I don't think anybody seriously think that's going to either. So you're either going to have double square footage, but we're also going to run into situations where Restaurants can only handle a certain amount of people. There's just so many unknowns. I don't want to go on with it, but I just ultimately I think we need to pause the whole thing because. Okay. I, All right. Thank you, Mr. Ellis. Hang there for a second, if you don't mind. Hang out there. Um, let's see if my colleagues have follow up questions. Okay. Not really um, at this time. Um, so, Mr. Ellis, when you talk about pausing, do you have a, a timeline in, in mind for that? I think we pause it until we are convinced as a community and as a state and as a country, we have moved to a post-COVID uh, situation. And I don't know when that would be. I'd probably be a lot, could get a lot of money if I could get that out, or get make that guess <laughs> right, but uh, that's not going to be the case. Okay. All right. Um, great. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ellis, I guess my other question then is um, uh, if I was just wondering what your take is on the convention center uh, in terms specifically thinking about the um, residents of Ellsville, just what your take is on the convention center expansion, um, even without the COVID um, complication that, that you've discussed? Well, it's been no, it, it has been no secret that I've been against the, the component that would fund it, the food and beverage tax, but we're talking about the convention center. And for Ellisville, I cannot see, other than political spin, there's no way it is going to uh, benefit Ellisville. It really is not. Um, we don't, uh, I mean, we do have some restaurants, but they're not right off Interstate 69. Our borders do not come out there. That's part of the two-mile fringe. And even the restaurants we do have 
I, I just don't see that's being a draw. And yes, we could capitalize on that and we probably would, but I've never believed that most of this convention center would ever be used by uh, non-town residents. And we're just, it's the same pool of people we have now. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so uh, for my colleagues, we're gonna try Mr. Fox again, but for my colleagues, um, a couple of quick questions for you. I'd like your input as we continue here. Um, shall we have Michelle go ahead and show the poll results? from the first two polls? Yeah? Yeah, I, I think that would be great. So if, Michelle, if you would do that. Um, and then the other question I have for you is that, um, is that we um, uh, also have um, uh, a situation with Zoom where we can have Angie's notes on the screen um, or we can have the poll questions, the written poll questions that were coming up, poll three and poll four. Uh, we can't do both at the same time. Uh, Michelle has to use share screen to do that. So which do you prefer that we do? I could just go ahead and ask those other questions later. Preference? Why, why don't we wait a little while before we share the other polls? The, the uh, written ones, we could try to do it verbally instead and see if that works. Maybe. It's another yeah. option. What do you think, Penny? Um, sorry, I was trying to digest what the results of the first poll were. <laughs> um, I, I think it's good to, to allow everybody to see the results of the poll so that if there's any discussion. No, that's not the question. The question okay. is whether we do the, um, have the notes on the screen or whether right. we do poll three and four. We can't do both. Oh, gotcha, sorry. Go ahead and do poll three and four. Okay, and then Angie, if you would keep taking notes and then we'll go back to your screen in a little bit. Is that okay for everybody? Okay, here's the other poll results, by the way. I'll do it. Okay. okay. Interesting, okay, good. So thank you all for responding to those two polls. We can bring those up again later. Um, but uh, so Ms. Dayton, if you would go ahead and post poll three and we'll give folks some time to answer it. Um, and then while we're doing that, uh, Mr. Fox is already on and now he is unmuted. So, Mr. Fox. Uh, sure. Uh, I just want to say that I'm not sure that the convention center expansion is going to benefit uh, Bloomington and Monroe County. Uh, there's everybody, all other cities seem to be trying to expand their convention centers. It's like a, a huge competition. Uh, for conventioners, uh, I don't see the. I really don't see the benefit going forward. Um, perhaps maybe ten years from now, in twenty thirty, maybe we can re revisit the idea of expanding the center. Uh, I, I posted a question here. I'm wondering what the current size of the convention center is. Does anybody know that offhand? In, in terms of square feet, what is, what is the size of the convention center at this right now? Uh, I would have to, I don't have any, my notes with me. Yeah, let's see if Talisha's here. Um, meanwhile, so folks, um, while we're gonna, I'm gonna go look and see um, if we have somebody who can answer that for us. I don't wanna rely on my memory. Um, and let's see. The reason I ask that, uh, you know, they're proposing 60,000 square feet expansion. Is that a doubling or is that a tripling or, you know, what is the right. current size of it? And right. So we'll, we'll get that answered for you. We do have uh, Ms. Kopic on, um, but uh, before we answer that for you, um, so let me tell everyone that if you want to answer the question that's posted on the screen, see the white screen, share your thoughts, what questions would you ask the convention center design consultants, go to the Q&A. 
um, and go ahead and enter your response to that uh, poll. Uh, all right, um, Ms. Kopic. Hello, uh, and thank you everybody for participating with this. This is an important conversation. And um, the total square foot of the building is 40,000 square feet, but the, all, the actual use of the space is 22,000 square feet. We are a very small facility. Um, and I think that's why we see that demand is that we have a community that likes to gather um, but uh, you know, in the whole scheme of things, we're a very small building, and um, and the building will be a hundred years old in uh, 2023. So, you know, it's a building that has some issues that need to be addressed as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks for uh, answering that, Ms. Kopic. I am always afraid to throw out statistical information, and you answered the question really well because you talked about the available square footage and the total square footage. And that is a great thing uh, for folks to know. Yes. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, so, Mr. Fox, do you have any uh, follow up comment? Uh, yes, it is a, a very small convention center uh, and 22,000 square feet is, is very small. So we're talking about basically more than doubling the size of the convention center, which is significant. Um, I do want to point out, I'm wondering, I, I drove around the convention center today. I looked at things. And I'm wondering if there's an, any evaluation of using the parking lot behind the Courtyard Marriott to expand the convention center in that direction to south of it. That parking lot's uh, you know, rather significant in size. And if you built up two stories like the current convention center, I'm sure you'd probably be able to squeeze in uh, at least 60,000 square feet. Uh, that's an option. Instead of going north and trying to cross uh, 3rd Street, just utilize that parking lot right next to it. Um, by the way, I should say I, I've been a Bloomington resident for a very long time. Uh, I, when I moved initially to Bloomington, the convention center was Tom O'Daniel Ford. And the uh, underpass, the Third Street underpass, had not yet been constructed. So I have seen things change quite a bit. Um, personally, as I said, you know, I'm just not sure that uh, jumping ahead on this convention center thing, just expanding it without really having a good idea of what conventions are going to come here, uh, where they're going to come from, what cities might a convention transfer from, let's say, would they transfer from Louisville to Bloomington or would they come down from Indianapolis to Bloomington? Where would these conventions come from? I, I have my doubts. Okay, let's see if my colleagues have any follow-up questions. Well, I, I would just like to point out that there are some problems with using that south parking lot in that a lot, at least a portion of it um, belongs to the, is it a Marriott there, the hotel that's there. Right, I can understand that. There could be some kind of deal like a ground lease or whatever. The city, the Marriott just wants that for their parking. If you can build a parking, uh, you know, one level of parking garage for them and then build the convention center on top, I'm sure they would be happy with that. They want the convention center to be a success because it helps their hotel. Uh, I imagine the subject could be worked out. Okay. Yeah. Ms. Giffins? The county actually. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Jones. I, I was just going to say that the county did buy quite a bit of land further south in that parking lot with the intention that it be used for the convention center. Right. And we have to keep in mind that, you know, that hotel is getting, is getting some age to it. So there might be a point of time where it, it becomes a little obsolete, needs a renovation. They might want a new hotel to the south or something like that. Mm -hmm. and you just have to keep in mind that, that in mind. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Giffins? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mr. Fox, when, when you first started speaking, um, 
I was under the impression that you were not in favor of expanding the convention center and then your latest statements indicate that you are trying to help us figure out a site for it. So um, can you can you clarify some of that for me? <laughs> uh, generally, there seems to be a push to to uh, to increase the size of the convention center. Uh, it seems to me that ultimately at some point it will happen. Uh, whether that begins now or whether it begins five years or 10 years from now, there'll be a movement to do that. Uh, I'm just looking at options for you instead of, uh, instead of building, let's say north of it and having a, a bridge cross third street, which seems pretty extravagant to me, is that you would look for something more modest in size and as I said, when I drove around the site, and I had done it before, the parking lot seems like a logical expansion site to me if you're just going to build 60,000 square feet. Now, if you're gonna build, you know, let's say 200,000 square feet, then you've got a whole nother ball game going on. But mm -hmm. we're talking a, a really a modest size expansion that probably could be accommodated on that parking lot. Okay. Or, or another option is to build another story, another floor on top of the current convention center. That might uh, add, you know, 20,000 square feet itself right there, 20 or 30,000. I'm just saying we need to probably think of more reasonable options instead of really extravagant options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Fox. We appreciate it. Um, and um, and for folks who are um, participating, we've we've got our second uh, poll question up. Go to, down to Q and A to answer the question: What information is still needed to make an informed decision about the scope and timing of the project? Um, and with that, let's see uh, who else um, would like to offer comment. Next up, we have Paul Ash. Great, Mr. Ash, thank you. Yeah, it, it, I know I'm comparing apples and oranges here, but to think back when we were first discussing the uh, the switchyard park, and I know that some people were, you know, a bit frustrated and still are with how long it has taken, but um, don't you think we're getting it right? And so maybe delay is not such a bad thing. Um, maybe we can, you know, in the end, look back on it in our dotage and say, oh, we got that one right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ash. Uh, questions or comments for Mr. Ash? It, sound, it sounds like you're uh, advocating for a delay. Is, is that based on COVID or is it based on um, other issues as well? You're talking to a man who has seen rather a lot of change in his life, and um, th that that affects my judgment. Yes, delay. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Ash. All right. Uh, let's see who's up next. It looks like uh, Talisha has a comment. Okay. Great, Ms. Kopic. Since we have you on the screen. Oh, okay. Hello. Um, I was just going to uh, reply back uh, that lot behind the Courtyard Marriott belongs to the city of Bloomington. And um, we have looked at that lot. Uh, it's very narrow, uh, which presents some challenges. And so, um, you know, developing in a downtown area is a challenge to do. And so that's why looking at all of these different angles was so important to do. Um, just because you have load in and load out, we don't want to have a negative impact on the neighborhood. We want to make sure things flow. Um, and so, you know, the community has spent years talking about this project. Thousands of dollars have been invested um, creating a whole ecosystem in the downtown area of attractions and shops and restaurants and, and places to gather, uh, you know, to make a vibrant 
county seat for Monroe County. That's a very important thing as, as a, a leader. And um, yes, the pandemic has kind of rocked that ecosystem. Uh, the longer it drags out, the more devastating it's going to be. Um, but you know, we're still hearing from people like associations, they need to connect with their members, companies need to connect with their employees, not for profits need to get back and have their fundraisers is what we're hearing and community members need their personal events back. And yes, hybrid will be an important part going forward, you can include more people with it, but we're always going to have that need to connect uh, and, and have live events. And, um, you know, we're working with uh, clients now on smaller events. We're doing our part to help keep that um, spread, you know, slow. And, you know, there are unknowns right now, but I think there's hope. And, you know, we're taking it slowly with strict protocols. Um, we're working with essential events uh, of companies that need to see their employees. There's testing that has to be done with some of the uh, schools that we work with. There was the poll worker training. There was the blood drives. There's, um, you know, now we're providing parking assistance for the COVID vaccine production workers. So, you know, a, a convention center, community center, conference center, whatever we want to call it, is something that brings our community together and it focuses on what people are thinking and doing at that time. We've watched it for 30 years of going up and down and you know, in the recession in 2008, people got together to talk about what to do about the recession. <laughs> you know, the opioid addiction, when all of that was happening, people came together to learn from each other. And Bloomington Monroe County is such a leader in the world of education. And yes, other communities have their centers, uh, but Bloomington, IU, Monroe County are our leaders in the state in education. And so, you know, IU is a huge customer here. Ivy Tech is. We have different um, associations that come in because Indiana University is located here. So now is a good opportunity to design a facility for the future. You know, it's the air, air filtration systems, it's more outdoor space, it's the um, open air rooms, touchless surfaces, screening as you come through. I mean, in a way, we're very fortunate that, um, you know, we are still in those beginning stages of design so that we could include those types of features in a new facility along with the sustainability. Um, you know, our current building has been an awesome space. It's been wonderful. But as we were saying, our community is outgrowing it and we're a regional um, destination. Uh, so we have to keep that in mind as well. And uh, we have employees that, you know, work in um, the hospitality industry throughout this county and and I just I want to take an opportunity to um, say thank you for using some of those food and beverage funds to keep our businesses going and open that was huge and what an opportunity to be able to do that other communities were not as fortunate and you know these next six months are going to be really really tough for all of us you know we're you know, talking to meeting planners who are now looking at the third quarter of next year for when they can get their events back. Um, we spend a lot of time scheduling and rescheduling and canceling and booking again and walking people through how they can have their events safely. And we're committed to that and we're very strict with our protocols, but you can definitely tell that customers appreciate that and um, that they're looking for guidance on how to have their events safely. Um, so I apologize, I could go on a long time with this, but um, you know, I think that um, you know, community engagement's important and always will be and uh, seeing people face to face people are going crazy, like they need to get out and be able to do this. So thank you very yeah. much. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Kopic. Um, we're just going to leave you on in case there are questions, um, if you don't mind. Um, okay. so, um, uh, so I hear you saying that you, you, um, um, are, you, you talk about some of the many things that we hashed over over the last few years. Uh, regarding the design, and we have looked at all of the land surrounding, and, and a lot of work has been done already on that issue. Um, 
and um, you've talked about the, the importance of the community aspect of it. And I agree that that was something that we were all really interested in from, from the beginning is, is making sure that this is not just a, a place for visitors, but truly a community space for meetings because there's just not enough of that. So um, I appreciate that. Um, either my colleagues want to add anything or ask questions? I don't have a question, but I find it really interesting that um, Ms. Kopik's already talking about changes that might be go that should go into design based upon what we've learned with COVID. Um, that's very forward thinking. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right, so we'll move on to the next um, commenter. Okay, next we have Alicia. All right, Ms. Krop, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? You sure can. Okay, good, my internet's a little scratchy because I've got high schoolers and other people working and all that <laughs> stuff. Hi, um, so my name is Alicia and I'm here representing the Wonder Lab. I'm the Marketing and Communications Director. Um, I did send our comment in via the email, but I thought I would read it out loud. It's from the Executive Director and the Admin Staff. Um, we would say that we are generally in support of the convention center expansion and have always been, um, although we would caution that any decision or action about the scope of this project before the launch of a vaccine and a better understood timeline for the course of the pandemic that follows the science is premature. Um, we think that any go ahead on this project needs a careful review of projected regional demographics, travel, conference environments. And that last bit is important because those have shifted dramatically within COVID to involve a much higher percentage of hybrid, meaning like virtual and in-person events. So the IT infrastructure for any new project needs to be reviewed with that in mind and addressed in a future plan. Um, we would recommend that no decisions be made as of right now and that we revisit this in early 2021. Uh, again, as the science becomes more clear and more is known about the pandemic trajectory and economic and social impacts. Great, thank you, Ms. Croft. Let's see if um, either of my colleagues have a comment or question, follow-up question for you. Okay. I'm just finding it interesting that um, so many people are still willing to support it, but really think that we should take a step back and see where things work out. And I suspect that if we did that, we'd have to go right back to the beginning with the feasibility study and all. all right. That's an interesting I, mean, I, can't, I can't speak to that. I don't know <laughs> if we'd have to go back to a feasibility study. Right. I, liked, I liked what Talisha had to say though about the air, the air quality upgrades that could be made and, and brought into the planning. That's, those are great things to do. We've had really good success with that at the museum, so. Yeah. You've done great work at the museum, by the way, with all Thank you. Um, adapting Thank you. and creating an online learning environment. That's just been wonderful to watch. Oh, I appreciate um, that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ms. Giffins, anything? You're on mute. You're on mute. Um, yeah, the, we keep hearing new things going into this, like incorporating different kinds of IT stuff for conferences that would go into any kind of you know upgrade to the current yeah. center. So yeah. it's interesting. Yeah, it is. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Ms. Krop, for joining us. Thank you. And, um, please stay with us if you'd like, um, as well as we continue our conversation to hear what other folks are saying in the community. Um, and um, next up. Next up, we have Mike. All right. Mr. McAfee, welcome. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Sure can. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, again, for having this. Um, it's, it's great to hear the new people that uh, I haven't heard their names before and involved in this project. So welcome. Um, I, we love the input. Um, I, I'm definitely going to say a couple things about some specific comments that have been made tonight. Um, um, I absolutely agree with what we're talking about here when we're talking about um, the future and, and technology and sustainability and upgrades. That's, that's always been a part of the plan. Um, 
Um, you know, we wanted to make it as modern as possible, addressing the current trends in the in the meetings and conventions industry. I should take a step back and make sure everybody understands. My name is Mike McAfee. I'm the executive director for Visit Bloomington. We work with um, the convention center to promote and market the convention center, as well as all tourism things in Monroe County. Um, I have a, I have salespeople. We, we, you know, somebody was asking, I think it was Mr. Fox, maybe it was asking about who, who comes here, who would come here, how competitive it is out there. Sure. Terre Haute is, is building a new convention center right now. Um, I know, uh, Indiana, I don't even like comparing us to Indianapolis because we're not trying to be Indianapolis. We're, 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 we're Bloomington. Um, we're the second most desirable meeting spot in the state of Indiana after Indianapolis. People love coming here for all the things we, that have already been said tonight, um, anchored by Indiana University, all that type of stuff. Um, you know, we, we've, we've all been experiencing technical difficulties a little bit tonight. That's, that's why face-to-face -face meetings will never go away. It is a great hybrid. Um, Talisha and I talk all the time about combining face-to-face -face with um, virtual meetings, even using that to sell packages of face-to-face of -face meetings followed up by a platform that we provide weeks later to groups that come here so they can follow up virtually with each other after the meeting to foreclosure on things and, and, and different types of follow-up, things that you're doing with the polls, you know, how was the meeting, what'd you learn from it, what could we do better, those types of things, that's great. Um, you know, regarding Ellettsville and, and benefits and things like that, Talisha did, did speak about that, but um, um, many, many people in Ellettsville work in the tourism and hospitality business around Monroe County. Many of them work in right downtown Bloomington. Um, for every $60,000 that is spent in this community at a tourism type event, there's a new job created. Um, if, if a group of 400, you know, we're, we're not trying to be in Indianapolis. Our goal is to bring in a new group of 400 people every week. So Sunday through Thursday, a new group of 400 people for three or four days, that would create three new jobs in Monroe County every week. Um, that's really the, the big, motivating factor for us doing this is that economic benefit and that um, um, uh, benefiting everybody's life in that way. Um, you know, I, one thing about, I, I think somebody even talked about, maybe we should stop and, and um, take a look at this in 2030. Um, well, you know, if, 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 if everything lined up and um, your group in the city met and, and got things rolling, say, um, and, 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 and we all agree the pandemic needs to be a um, uh, result. We need to get past that and end that before we can move forward. But even if your group in the city got together and worked things out and were um, on what we wanted to do and, and say, we just got so lucky. And by the end of 2021, we had a plan it would be 2025 or 2026 before we were done and, and ready to open. Um, it, most groups are booking two to three years out. So, so you're talking 2028, 2029, 2030, before we'd even be booking groups of four to 500. So that's, that's right in the timeline. That's a realistic timeline. Yeah. Um, um, you know, another thing I want to say about the food and beverage tax, I know, I know we're not talking about that here, but I know what um, William else was talking about a little bit. Um, that is the best economic development tool this county has. Um, I know your group at one time was looking at something for the Quarry Park. I'm not exactly sure what the status of that is now. Um, I know that my, I know that I have a presentation to you on December 9th talking about turf fields at Cars Farm Park. I'm not saying food and beverage tax would be used for that, but those are the types of projects that those funds can be used for. There are 32 of those that exist in the state of Indiana. Um, other municipalities all over the state are just thriving using those funds for um, benefits to their communities. So we've done study after study after study. There are so many associations, groups of two to 500 that would love to be able to come to downtown Bloomington and, and go out in the, on the town and, and feel like a kid again and that energy that they have, that's what they love about Bloomington. And, and that's why this project will work and that's why the demand is there. I'll stop now and, and answer any questions if anybody has them for me, thanks. Okay. Let's see if my colleagues have questions.
You're on mute, Penny. No, that's a no. Okay. No, sorry. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'm sure we're going to have follow-up questions for uh, both Mr. McAfee and Ms. Kopic um, <laughs> once we once we get through this uh, conversation as well. So you know we'll be reaching out with that information. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. McAfee. Uh, next up, please. Next up is Margaret. Hello, Margaret. Welcome. Hello. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for convening this meeting, number one. And number two, how impressed I am with all of the participants who have really spent a long time making Bloomington as special as it has become. And so I want to thank you for all of your good work in bringing to fruition a very special place. And, um, and we're talking about something that's controversial and that's the expansion of the convention center. And part of the reason why it's controversial is because of um, what we've just learned through COVID, that uh, COVID-19 has exploited almost all of our vulnerabilities as a town, uh, such that hotels have now, uh, that have been built in the past to support the convention center are now being used as dormitories for students. And, um, I would say that part of what we're experiencing in Bloomington in this push to expand the convention center is that um, there are a line of uh, consultants who have a market solution for towns exactly our size. And they shop it around because they maximize their profit when they sell it to Fort Wayne, when they sell it to Terre Haute, when they sell it to Evansville and also to Bloomington. And we fall into that uh, category of towns of a certain size that if they could just put us on that template, then they will maximize their profits. And that's all fine and good if the convention center um, meets our needs. And to me, it's not completely clear that the convention, the proposed expansion of the convention center would work to um, meet our needs. Instead, I think it would exploit our vulnerabilities. Um, I, I just don't see how it can be justified uh, without integration of some of our more core values into the construction of a convention center that specifically addresses some of the latent needs and wants of our community. And I mean, we've everyone who is on the phone call now knows some of those longstanding community needs for more theater space, et cetera, for more performance space. But in essence, we're, we're kind of dallying in, in creating welfare for the university. We're building a structure and a convention center for support of yet um, what is too dominant in our community. And I feel that for economic development to be meaningful to the residents of Monroe County, that the commissioners, as you are doing, and, and uh, also Ms. Preedmore and also Mr. McAfee and also um, Mr. Fox, we have to dig deep into our community and bring in the people who have not been uh, brought to the center of the life and the heart of our town who make Bloomington a special place. We have to, we have to integrate, integrate our, our assets and our economy and we have to diversify it. And a convention center just continues down a path that it accentuates our vulnerabilities. And um, I think that that's uh, pretty much uh, what I have to say, except that, um, you know, by definition, the university is a convention center. So maybe Monroe County and maybe the city of Bloomington doesn't need to dabble in that so heavily at the taxpayer expense. So thank you. Thank you. If you'd stay on the line, um, uh, Margaret, um, let's see if there are any comments or questions from my colleagues, follow-up questions. Yeah, thank you, Margaret. Um, I'm just wondering, are you suggesting that it might be better if IU built a convention center and or do you think it would be better if they um, 
were to contribute more heavily to the convention center? All of the above. Do, do you have any? I don't have the statistics on how uh, big a user the university is of the convention center, but um, it seems to me that there's a, a strong interaction, and uh, and that perhaps you know we've I've been around Bloomington since the you know in and out for an, maybe most of my life, and uh, we've had we have the Biddle Center, we have. Poplars that you know began as a convention center and now is office space, et cetera. I think that we need to concentrate more on diversifying away from what makes us most vulnerable. And what makes us most vulnerable is everything we've experienced during this COVID-19. And that's an over over reliance on hotels and restaurants and uh, tourism to make uh, the community work. And even though we have a lot to see and a lot to be proud of, I think that we need to um, work on supporting uh, some of the economy that isn't always so celebrated in our, in our community. Interesting. Yeah, it's a really interesting point um, about, about moving and shifting even more toward that economic development that's based on restaurants and hotels and, and sort of the service industry when that's the very first thing that's vulnerable in a recession or in a COVID pandemic or something like that. It's a really interesting point. Um, did, you, did you have anything to ask? Well, I just wanna thank you. I know that it's not been easy for you three commissioners to do uh, the county's work in so many areas throughout all this difficult time, but here you are, you know, um, attending not only to the healthcare crisis that we have, but to uh, our future economic viability. And I just want to thank you for your hard work and for your thoughtfulness and your inclusion of the community in this discussion. Thanks, Margaret. Hey, do you, could you give us some more information on what you think that diverse economy would include and, and what, what kinds of investments the county can make to support it? Well, I, I know, I know you the, mentioned theaters and, uh, and music performance, cultural aspects. Right, and I only say that because, you know, some of my, the members of the community who work at... Um, for instance, at Cardinal Stage, which is a world-class theater, uh, per performing theater arts um, community that could grow and bring in more people, that they are always in search of, uh, of more performance space. That's number one. And number two, I worry about um, leaving out the agriculture, uh, agricultural uh, developers who work so, um, so vibrantly in our community until recently, you know, they were at the center of it with our farmer's market. And I wonder what more should we be doing to support that thriving organic farming uh, market that we have in and around uh, this region of the state. Uh, third, I think about um, the, the studio artists that work in uh, in their homes around the community and whether or not we should create in, instead of a convention center uh, an arts trail that takes people away from the center of town and brings them out into the community and into the county that is uh, has been uh, revered for its beauty since uh, is since it was founded you know so why should we not be emphasizing the arts and also some of the skilled, um, I, you know, I know there there's opposition to it, but uh, some of the skilled hunters that we have and the skilled trappers that we have and the skilled archery uh, bow makers, the skilled um, musical bow makers, you know, that we, we should be doing an inventory of these individuals who have who are doing world-class things throughout our county and figure out an integrative approach that emphasizes them. I mean, Steinsville is known as one of the dark sky 
night areas in the country, and that's an, a burgeoning area of tourism. You know, and we ourselves, have, in my work with the Plan Commission, we've talked about um, emphasizing some of our quarries and uh, making that a heralded uh, sense of place and also bringing in some of our history and our assets and our um, and our core values into a manifestation of what we value. You know, I just feel that the convention center is whole hum. It's a dime a dozen. It's marketed to towns exactly our size all over the country. And we should not take a lazy person's approach to economic development. We should go forward, be imaginative, be bold, and, uh, and celebrate what we're doing so well. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. I appreciate your, your input. Thank you. um, and um, we're going to go ahead to the next person. And while um, after Michelle does that, we're going to go ahead and close out this last poll. Um, so you're welcome to continue to input information into Q&A. We're going to have to um, go back and, and um, review that in a little bit. Um, but um, um, Ms. Purdy, if you would go ahead um, and bring your screen back up with the notes, we can work from that. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Like um, magic. Look at that. <laughs> need to take it to the top. All along. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> and we'll and we'll go on to the next. Um, the next person, next up whenever you're ready. Jerry Hayes. Great, thank you. Mr. Hayes, welcome. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate uh, you all having this meeting. I think it's really um, a good idea to start talking about it again. Um, I, just so it's clear, I'm in favor of expansion of the convention center as originally proposed, uh, but I agree with others that have said that uh, we should not begin construction until we see demand is returned and, and the uh, food and beverage tax revenues have stabilized. However, beginning construction, uh, there'll be several months or maybe even a year or so uh, of things in preparation of that. So I think it's a good time to maybe start doing some things and thinking about some things we can do in preparation of that, if, if it does come to pass, uh, things such as um, get, getting with the city and, and get the uh, memorandum of understanding secured, uh, perhaps at least discussing the capital improvement board and um, maybe working on that. Um, one of the things I'm hopeful that we can take advantage of uh, would be low interest rates. So financing the project would be um, be a great time to, to do the financing on the project. And I, I expect rates will probably be low for, for, for some time, but um, you know, I think now it's timely. So um, anyway, that's, that's pretty much it. As far as Margaret's uh, comment about um, Indiana University, um, I think we're fortunate to have a, a customer like Indiana University close by, and they're going to pay for using the convention center just like any other user. So I think that's sort of like a built-in advantage for us to have Indiana University as a, as a customer of the convention center. So um, I think that's it. Again, thank you so much for having this meeting. And um, I think that concludes my comments. All right, thank you, Mr. Hayes. Would you stay on a moment? Let's see if there are any questions or follow-up from my colleagues. I'm not, no. No. Okay. So it, so it sounds like um, uh, you are um, in favor of the expansion, but waiting to the time period beyond COVID to uh, formalize any further agreements. Is that, does that sound well, accurate? Uh, as far as um, any, signing any contract for construction, but I think uh, as far as we could probably work on a memorandum of understanding in that agreement, go ahead and get that started and um, get some of those things out of the way so we're ready to go when if, okay. if and when it does take place. Mm -hmm. So like the um, capital improvement board 
moving yes. forward and things like that. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Hayes. Excellent. All right. Let's see uh, who else uh, would like to comment today. Join our conversation. Next, we have Susan. Great. Oh, Ms. Dyer, welcome. Thank you so much for um, letting me speak. I want to say uh, thank you to all of you again, because we are one of the cultural um, tourism destinations that was able to benefit from some of the food and tax money uh, to help us get through this time. It's a scary time. However, if history has shown us anything and human behavior, um, it shows us that we will go back to face-to-face -to -face, uh, gatherings. People want to get back together. We're already looking to when we can send our own staff back to conferences because as much as we will be doing hybrids because we have that technology, um, it's just not the same. People are less likely to attend things. And you know maybe it'll help actually bring more people into it. We're also one of the downtown businesses that relies on the traffic that um, the convention center brings in. You know, the, the numbers right now are saying that probably about a third of museums will shut down um, worldwide because of this. We are lucky enough that we're not gonna have to be one of those. And that's because we have such a wonderful community that's helped keep us alive. Um, and that's, that's a wonderful thing. We are also one of the nonprofits that annually uses the convention center for our fundraiser. Um, and would love the opportunity to be able to grow that. Um, I was able to participate in some of the design meetings and I loved the design that they were coming up with. And I love hearing that Talisha and Mike are already thinking about all the kinds of things that we're gonna need to go forward and that we have the opportunity and we're not behind the ball game as far as incorporating those kinds of things going forward. Um, we will move past this pandemic and we will get together again because that's what people do. Uh, you know, even the 1918 flu, it was two to three years and people were just chomping at the, fit, the bit to get back in person. We will do that again. There will be another pandemic. We'll be more prepared next time. Um, so we have supported and continue to support the expansion. I'm not for waiting because I think we've already, as Mike said, got a timeline several years out before anything is gonna be opening up. Um, but that's basically what I wanted to say. Great, and I will, I will note that um, Ms. Dyer is with the uh, Monroe County History Center. I meant to say um, that, thank you, yes. Yes, okay, I thought, I thought you had, I thought maybe I better make sure. Um, no, I am the executive director with the Monroe County History Thank Center. You. Okay, Dan. <laughs> Thank you. I don't mean to, you know, uh, get rid of your anonymity here, but you started yeah. talking about it, so I jumped on it. So uh, let's see if my colleagues have um, questions or comments or follow up. No, but I'm I'm pleased that um, we were able to help the History Center with some funds that came through the food and beverage tax. It's really meant the world to us. So we really, we really, really appreciate that. And I know Wonder Lab was lucky enough to participate in that as well. So helping to keep museums alive is, is a great thing. And that's something that Monroe County does. Yeah, it's, it's been, it's been really good. Yeah, it's so interesting um, to hear you talk about this timing, because I think what you raised for me is this really interesting situation that we're in where um, let's say we're really super, super lucky um, and everything goes according to plan and we are sort of out of pandemic um, fear um, and spread uh, by let's say June of 2021. That's if things go really super well, which, which no one thinks that there won't be complications because there probably will be, but let's say it all goes well. Then, then we're in that position where if the center moves forward, let's say we start meeting um, again at the end of 2021 to finalize a contract, we really are looking at 2029, 2020, 2030, which sounds so far away, uh, th before those larger groups would come in. And that's beyond that point 
where you're and, and I think you raise a really good point about the historical significance of things like the 1918 um, flu uh, influenza, which was so destructive to this country. Um, but yes, people really wanted to get back out and, and they did, but that's 2030 is beyond that moment of, um, you know, resurging interest in being social and gathering face to face. So, um, uh, so that's really, I, I just, it's just kind of raising for me this whole timing issue. And, and, um, I'm really glad that you raised that. Yeah, that is my concern. Destruction takes a long time. People's memories do not last a long time. And by 2030, you know, we will be back to normal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there may be more masks in our lives in the future, but we'll be doing everything we can to get back to normal, to be able to go to restaurants, to be able to walk around. And to, you know, even as, as I said, our staff, we're looking forward to being able to send them back to conventions and conferences to meet with their peers, to learn new things. And that just works better in person. Yeah. I, I was also struck by the statistic that a third of museums may close. That is, I just think about the cultural loss in so many communities um, who will lose that um, connection with their history or with their art. Um, that is just, that's shocking. That's shocking to hear. So it is, and and it it'll be a lot of the small ones. But even looking right. at the European museums like the Louvre, they're not looking at things going back to normal because of tourism until like 2024. That's still way earlier than when this convention center would be ready. Yeah. So, yeah, interesting to think about that. Thank you for raising that. I really, really do appreciate that. Nice. Uh, my colleagues have anything else to add on that? Just the, the thought of losing a third of the museums worldwide is just tragic. When I travel so often, I stop in tiny little towns and visit their tiny little museum. And you really get to know the town that way. And those are the ones that will probably really be losing. And that's what we count on is people like you that come to tiny little towns and, you know, I have parents who are waiting for their kids to wake up in the morning so they go check out the local history center um, or you know convention attendees who are you know going out for a bite to eat and then let's check this out too we rely on that and that that helps us a lot yeah yeah very very good points okay good deal thank you thank you all right so let's see if we have anyone else who wishes to speak Talisha had another comment. Huh? Hi. Um, I just wanted to, um, with uh, Margaret Clemens, just uh, appreciate her comments and the creativity. Uh, we certainly agree with that. Uh, but as she was listing those uh, types of events that are types of groups that we should engage, it struck me that we've had. Um, we do eight artist sales, like groups of uh, events that people can come in and sell their wares from the Artisans Guild, the Glass Guild, the Pottery Guild, the Local Quilters Guild, the Handmade Market. Um, you know, we've done that in the past every year. They've been annual events. We've had two agricultural conferences over the last two years. Um, we've got an agricultural company that comes here for their uh, team training. Um, we've had uh, the Indiana uh, Co-op annual conference here. Um, so it's, it's those types of uh, events that bring those categories of people together uh, to learn more about what they're doing. So in a way we are helping support those industries. And I thought that that was just an important part to clarify that, you know, a year ago we had 500 events and those uh, events all kind of touch on different areas of uh, the economy to support. So I thought that was information that was worth sharing. We haven't had any hum hunter trapper type events. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, people come, you know, cause of uh, like, we've had two sustainability conferences and it's like, that's what our community is known for that, that those are the groups that come here and have their events here. 
Yeah, great, thank you. Great, let's see if there's um, anyone else who wishes to make a comment. Next up is Jay Murphy. Great, thank you. Mr. Murphy, welcome. Hello, can you hear me okay? We sure can. Good, thank you. Well, first of all, thanks for the opportunity to speak and I appreciate you uh, putting this in front of all of us because, you know, um, several months ago, we decided to put this on pause for a good reason. And uh, and it's, it's a good and important project to continue to talk about. Uh, again, this, my, my name is Jim Murphy and I'm president of CFC. And, and I remember whenever we acquired the Tom Daniel building and then later sold it to uh, the county. And, and um, I'm also on the board of directors for Downtown Bloomington Inc. And I'm on the Convention Center Building Corporation. So I think it's pretty obvious that I am in favor of the expansion and renovation of the uh, Convention Center. Uh, I, I really appreciate the timeline that Commissioner Jones shared with us. I thought it was very helpful and remind us that we have been working on this project really for over three decades now. And uh, a lot of work has gone into that and uh, a lot of uh, things that we have learned as well. Uh, there's been a lot of challenges also along the way and uh, was just mentioned, uh, Susan Dyer just mentioned the influenza of 1918. Well, not that long ago, you know, the uh, recession of 2000. Nine, that was a two-year recession, 2007 through 2009. And the uh, convention business took a hard hit in that, but we came back uh, like we always do. And, uh, and we'll come back again after this. I'm, I'm completely um, confident of that. Um, the uh, other communities that has been mentioned are... Uh, building and expand their convention centers because they anticipate come back in the industry as well. You know, the convention center, as, as you know, impacts the community in many different ways, in regional and local meetings, uh, as was just discussed, not-for-profits, arts, culture, cultural, economic uh, development. Uh, these are drivers for local businesses, and most of these businesses are small business owners that uh, is supported by the convention goers. Uh, also, as mentioned earlier, uh, was the uh, studies that had done. I want to say, I think it was Aaron Predmore of the chamber, I'm not sure if it was her or not that mentioned the studies, but there's been several studies done on the uh, convention soon over the years. Uh, the ones that I recall is HVC and Hunden. And each one of those studies uh, suggests that uh, an expansion of the convention in Bloomington, Indiana is the right thing to do and Bloomington is poised for attracting uh, existing and new businesses, uh, both uh, locally and regionally. And uh, as, as Mike said earlier, Mike Maxey said earlier, was the second most desired location to, uh, to go to in terms of conferences, conventions, um, second only to Indianapolis. Uh, I would, however, suggest that we wait uh, until the pandemic, uh, is behind us and we know more. However, I think that time is very sensitive. You know, I don't think we wait until everything is done. Once we've seen the pandemic starting to slow down and, and we feel that we have a, an understanding and, and are in control of it to some extent, to, what, to the extent that we can be, that we then start up the conversations of the commencement and expansion. Uh, and, and I'm not going to uh, get into the weeds of what the building should look like, although I do appreciate and respect Talisha's comments about the open area space uh, for the convention, and I agree with her on that. Uh, there's been a lot of work done, as many of you have been involved with, with those meetings, those charrettes, the um, public meetings, the um, um, architectural meetings, and, and we did arrive at a plan uh, based on uh, all the information that we have received on that. However, that plan, I do believe, should be looked at. I don't think we should uh, do away with the plan. I think we should look at it, probably keep most of it, but we might, based on the information that we now have on this pandemic and how, what we've learned, we might want to make some uh, amendments or changes, adjustments to that plan uh, going forward. Because um, I do think that's in invaluable. 
Uh, I think that's probably all that I, I want to say, but again, I am supportive of, of moving forward with this at the appropriate time. And again, thank you for your time and the opportunity. Thank, thank you, Mr. Murphy. Let's see if um, my colleagues have comments. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, if you know, if you have an idea of what adjustments we might need to consider and uh, elaborate a bit on that. Well, piggybacking on what Felicia already said, you know, the open space, which there is, there was some open space already designed in this center, but I think we should review that again. Uh, certainly our uh, cleaning and uh, sanitizing protocol uh, needs to be um, considered. Now that's not building design, but that, that's more operational. Uh, built the, the building design could also play into that as well. Um, and, and audio visual and, and, and spacing. There's a lot of things that uh, I don't you know, honestly have the answers for all those, but I think that all those things should be considered as we go forward. Uh, I know it, it, each of us are doing things different than we did several months ago, right? You know, um, many of us are working from home. I'm sitting at my home office right now talking with you rather than meeting you in the courthouse. So there will be things like that I think that we're going to have to take a good hard look at. Thank you. Ms. Giffins, did you have anything? No, I, I just was picking up on something that Mr. Murphy said that, you know, about adjustments. Maybe, you know, we've been looking at um, specialized lighting to help with um, killing viruses. So maybe those kinds of things, if we go forward with this, well, uh, could be taken into account. Well, thank you. I'm glad you, I'm glad you said that uh, because one of the things that the, actually the convention center is doing currently is as they have installed some devices down the, down at the current existing, I'm sorry, the current convention center that uh, helps to eliminate the viruses going through the HVAC systems. So clearly that would be something that we would want to do as well. Yeah. Uh, there are ionizers that have been installed. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I'm wondering if um, you know of any plans or if anybody has already issued anything in the convention industry in general, um, any predictive models about where they think things are going um, or how they think conventions will change because of COVID um, or when they think the industry will sort of gear back up. Uh, will it take six months, nine months, a year? I don't know. Have you seen anything in 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 the you know professional literature on this yet? No, no, I have not. Uh, the only thing that I have read is that the experts in in the industry said that, as was discussed earlier, that people want to be with other people, and and they fully anticipate that the convention uh, industry will rebound. Uh, but I have not heard any types of schedules or timelines or anything of that nature. But again just referring to Terre Haute and Indianapolis, the fact that they are building now, and I'm assuming they're probably a couple of years out before they're complete. So uh, so I, I heard 2030 earlier, that seemed like a long way away for me. I mean, I would think it would be much closer to 2000, you know, 20, I don't even wanna say date really, but, but that's what I say, I think we just need to be very sensitive and monitor that very closely. Right. And not wait till, you know, we're, we're through with that before we start the next phase, but kind of, overlap that and merge into it as it phases mm -hmm. it can be ready to move forward. Yeah. You know, and, and we're sort of where we left things was sort of at this precipice of, you know, signing a, a massive uh, contract and um, for the completion of the design and, and, you know, the beginning phases. Um, and that didn't yet happen, but um, it's just, it just seems like, um, you know, if we're being asked to, it makes sense to wait, but at the other hand, does it make sense to wait? And, and um, I just think it's a, it's an interesting point um, that you raise. And, and I think, I think looking at the timeline is going to be very important. Agree. That, that, that's why I comment about, I think we should wait, but monitor the progress of the mm -hmm. pandemic make so that we can start moving in. And, and there's a lot of what I would refer to as soft activities that need to happen prior to the, the, the hard activities. Mm -hmm. So those, uh, I, I believe it was Jerry that mentioned something about the CIB or the contracts or MOU. Things like that can be 
moving forward, you know, before we sign these other contracts. And actually some of them have to move forward before these contracts were signed. Yeah. Great. Okay, good. All right, let's see if there's any other, um, are any other comments? Looks like uh, Talisha has another comment. Okay, Ms. Kopik. Uh, yes, you had had a question about um, industry standards and uh, we're part of the International Auditorium Venue uh, Managers. And so they talk weekly about uh, large facilities and how they're handling different things. And um, one, I mean, you know, when a vaccine gets here, when we see what's happening with that, that's going to help quite a bit. Um, the earliest they're looking at is kind of um, third quarter, fourth quarter of 2021 before they start getting things back. Like I said earlier, people are booking, they're looking, they're talking about it, they're trying to get there, but then they'll reschedule. So it's all about building customer trust and confidence and, you know, really starting to beat this pandemic uh, of when, you know, things will start getting back and going. But, you know, the types of facility uh, changes that could, you know, entrance and exits and the way those are handled, uh, you know, making sure space is very flexible has always been very, very important. Um, so, you know, we're in, in contact with those people of like the latest trends and, uh, you know, it's been interesting because you know, there'll be some information that comes out early, so they'll try that and that's not really working. So they're, they're working through some things now. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, it looks like there's um, another hand raised. Is it me, Julie, Mike McAfee? I, have I think it up. is you. Hi, um, very quickly, I just wanted to follow up. Um, I'm echoing what Talisha said, the question about research. I'm, I'm holding in my hand a 116 page document called the Coronavirus Travel Sentiment, key findings for what's ahead by a, a group called Destination Analysts that came out in November. Um, my, my, my staff, we're, on, we're in webinars, we're in Zoom calls um, many times throughout the week looking at the latest research. Um, right now, 43% of meeting planners are actively involved in processing new requests for proposals. 70% have future face-to-face -face events booked. Now, assuming the, um, the, the pandemic is, um, you know, we, we put an end to the pandemic, you know, sometime in spring, April or May, uh, you know, that's, that's mostly what this research is based upon, that, that kind of timeline. They're, they're looking at, as Talisha talked about, a, um, the, 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 more and more meeting planners booking things, um, com coming back to about 80% of, of where it was pre-pandemic um, in 2022 and full recovery in 2023. I, I do want to say, you know, I'm the person here who, who threw out the, the 2030 date, you know, that was just me randomly talking off the top of my head. Obviously, um, it, it could be much sooner than that if, if things get rolling, uh, you know, a year or two earlier than that. So I don't want everybody to think, wow, this isn't going to happen until 2030 because Mike McAfee said that. That was just, you know, if, if, if you know, if, if we're not able to start building for, for three years from now and it takes three years to build, then, yeah, that, that's what we're looking on. But but it could be much sooner than that. And, um, I, you know, Susan Dyer had some great things to say, and I, I echo what she said about, you um, um, as we get this thing rolling and, and things start happening, people people do want to come here and people want to meet face to face. So, thank okay. you. Great, thank you. Uh, we had somebody else with their hand raised and that hand went down. So I don't know if there's anyone else. Just to see if anyone else has a general comment they wish to make. There's one hand from Joyce. Great. Ms. Poling, welcome. Thank you. What a great meeting. I think we've all learned something and uh, had an opportunity to talk about what has happened and what can happen. Most certainly, I think all of us have learned during COVID that building standards are going to change. And most certainly, 
perhaps we were lucky that we weren't started and we can look at those building pl plans and and make changes that are needed to make our building and our community more secure as we do have meetings because I agree that everyone wants to come to Bloomington in Monroe County. And I think we also need to think about how people are using the, the convention centers uh, during this time. We've seen them used as hospitals and as uh, for people to stay in to, uh, you, you know, instead of a hotel and so forth and so on. So lots of things to learn, but I think we need to get started while those interest rates are low and we have lots of people ready to uh, venture down to see us. And good job commissioners on the meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pauling. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, yeah, so it's interesting. So you may raise a good point about the interest rates. I think that's been raised before, but I'm gonna write that one down. And um, and yes, we, we've seen some great uses for um, the building space, you know, during the pandemic, um, they've been gracious enough to host our blood drives. Um, and those have been just booked out, which has been great. We're doing a few a month now, some evenings, some daytime. Um, anybody interested, go to uh, redcross.org and book in an appointment. Uh, a little plug there. But um, but also the poll worker training is another good example. So um, there are many uses for the space um, as it is now. And, and I appreciate the fact that uh, folks at the convention center have been so willing to be flexible and thoughtful about sharing that space to benefit the community. Um, so let's see if um, uh, Ms. Jones or Ms. Giffins has a question or follow-up comment for you. Thank you for weighing in and, and yeah, bringing up some new points. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, yes. So it's always great to have Joyce polling with us. Thank you. <laughs> You're wonderful. And we appreciate all your, you've been um, attending these meetings all along. We really appreciate that. You've been, you've been a consistent voice. So we do appreciate that so much. All right, let's see if there's anyone else who wants to raise their hand. Um, looks like we got one more, yes. Like we have Russell Ryle. Thank you. Good evening. Great meeting. It's been very informative. I'm a retired accountant. I know there's a lot of demand and need in our community today and in the future, regardless of what the uh, structure of meetings are for space, for meeting space. But I have to come back to the question. Will the taxpayer be forever paying the operating cost of this facility? Question mark. How do we build a facility that can at least fund its own day-to-day -day operating expenses? To me, that is the key question. There is many great things we could do, but it has to pay for itself. We can't let the general taxpayer, the general fund, pay the way for these much needed facilities. They've got to generate enough revenue, provide enough fees to pay for the building. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Rowell. Note that those, um, those figures and tabulations were done pre-COVID uh, 2019 and uh, the conventions, it's, it's an interesting mix of funding mechanisms, um, including the innkeeper's tax, um, uh, the food and beverage tax, um, and you know, by the time everything's built, then you're going back and revising, um, <laughs> remodeling buildings. Um, so, um, and and the convention centers of this size require an outlay for marketing. Um, so there's an expense there um, that's that's just industry standard. Um, and so there. You know that's that's been a question that's been discussed for a few years now. Is is 
what is the level of investment versus what you get back in terms of economic development. So, uh, but you raise a great point. Um, let's see if there are follow-up questions or comments from Commissioner Jones or Commissioner Giffens. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Ryle. Um, I was just, you, you mentioned fees. Um, do, you do you have any other specific suggestions for how the convention center might be brought to pay for its own operations? No, I don't. I'm not that familiar with the business per se of running a convention center, but I know when you look at a business proposal, a business opportunity, you've got to look at the operating budgets, the revenues, the expenses, and the business has to pay its own way. And I'm sort of looking at the convention center like any other operation. It at least has to break even. It should pay its own way. And you mentioned that there's already been several studies and budgets and numbers generated, but this was all pre-COVID. One thing, <laughs> excuse me, without COVID consideration, we now have this technology of Zoom for our meetings. How is that gonna change the operations of businesses in the future? Will that change the model on which your revenue and your, your members were generated? It's almost like we need to look at possibly rerunning that study. Good point. Good point. Yeah. And I would like to point out that there never has been any intention for the operating expenses to be paid out of county general which is the, the place that most property taxes get paid to. Um, so different mechanisms are being looked at. Um, one thing that, that this conversation has made me a little curious about is if we could look for more private participation and if possibly more local businesses would want to kind of help cover some of these expenses. That is a wonderful thought. Uh, never turn down other paying partners, but I really wonder in the overall scheme of things, let's go out to 2030. How will the economic model of running a convention center work, look? And how will the demand for that convention center, uh, demand for its space and its utilization, uh, uh, support an additional large convention center in Indiana, let alone in Bloomington? We'd all love to have one in our town. But look at what Terre Haute is doing and these other cities are doing. Uh, I see, you know, regardless of what happens in many aspects of our unknowns, we're going to be in an extremely competitive market. And it's going to be difficult in some ways to compete in it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Giffens, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I... I, I kind of, as I hear some of this, I need to go back in my head and, and try to remember what is being built in Terre Haute and things like that. Um, but that is a valid point to, to be considering. Well, not only what is being built now, but what will they build? You know, we're mm -hmm. trying to use a crystal ball going out nine years and my Harry Potter crystal ball is made of milk glass. Uh, <laughs> well, I'll, I'm gonna end with a comment. I was a great science fiction reader in my youth in the 60s and 70s. I don't know of one science fiction writer that projected the internet. <laughs> so, you know, how are we going to know what we're dealing with in nine years if we're making a commitment of our county resources today in hopes that in nine years from now, it'll pay off? Yeah, or five years or seven years. We don't right. know that it's nine. That's an estimate, yeah. Uh, Especially really when the county you have so many other needs of this county, uh, mm -hmm. infrastructure, uh, roads, uh, 
you know, the list goes on and on. But mm -hmm. my one comment about county general is the county general fund is the funding of last resort when bondholders don't get paid. And that is the, you know, we may say it'll never happen. But it's my understanding that if push comes to shove and there's a big bond out there and a payment due, the county bond, the general fund is the last resort of where that money's mm -hmm. coming from. Right, right. And it's the city um, or the county, depending on the contract. Um, yeah. yeah, so same thing. Um, yeah, those those are excellent points. And, um, and yeah, I, I guess that's, I guess that's interesting to consider is that we we always did have to operate with a convention crystal ball, but now there's the COVID aspect to it, and that just makes the crystal ball harder to read. Mm -hmm. So yeah, good good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Great meeting, people. Great meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Al. Um, anyone else wish to um, wish to speak? Let's try not to go back too much to. Um, let's see if there's anyone else besides Mr. McAfee. Nothing, nothing, um, nothing against you, Mr. McAfee. I'm just trying to make sure we hear from all the residents first before we go back to, um, but I appreciate, I bet you're going to answer our question for us. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't, I don't see any other hands raised. So let's go ahead to, uh, Mr. McAfee. A few came up as you said that. Oh, good. Let's go back and see who else is there, and then we'll come back to Mr. McAfee. How about that? Uh, next up will be Mike Campbell. Okay, great. Hello, Mr. Campbell. Hi there. Uh, this is Mike Campbell. I'm um, Associate Director at the Indiana Memorial Union and the President of the Convention and Visitors Commission. Um, and just a uh, to talk a little bit about some of the financial security, I, I would say that um, uh, with the funding uh, that's already uh, been approved by the um, uh, by the state and by this county, um, uh, and allowing us to have both the food and beverage tax and coupling that with the innkeepers tax, even during um, as bad a year as 2020 <laughs> has been financially. Um, there is still um, funds uh, and sufficient funds uh, to look for the type of um, expansion that we've been talking about in the past. So one way in which to, to ensure that um, we are able to financially pay for as much of the operating system as, or operating expenses as possible is to make sure we build it large enough in order to be able to take care of those uh, type of conventions that uh, that would generate that type of revenue. So that's that's really it. I, I don't want to uh, go into to uh, too much or or uh, or go into too many figures and, and things of that nature. But there is historical records for for tax collection for innkeepers tax going back thirty years. Uh, and we do have those those projections. Uh, and and as bad as this year has been uh, from a travel and tourism standpoint, um, it we have not to this point um, run into a, a cash issue where we've where we've had to come to the county in the general fund, uh, and that's just with the innkeepers tax. Uh, not not speaking at all about what the food and beverage tax. Would generate for this. So, right. so from a, a security standpoint, I, I think we're um, good stewards uh, of uh, of uh, tax dollars and in county um, uh, it trusts us with with some of those decisions, and and in doing so, we take that real serious to make sure that uh, those uh, resources are well well shepherded. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Campbell. And I know you're you're referencing uh, we have a current bond payment due um, um, on the last renovation, and and I know that the um, innkeepers tax is um, supporting that, and that's great to hear that uh, even with the downturn in tourism, that there's uh, still sufficient dollars. I know you you all have been very careful about keeping 
uh, money set aside for that kind of thing, and and you've done you've done really well with that. So appreciate that. Um, let's see if my colleagues have any comments or questions for Mr. Campbell. Okay. So let's go on. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, sir. Um, let's go on to uh, Mr. Knott. I think he is the next one, Greg Knott. Hi, yes, I, I just wanted to say I, I'm opposed to the food and beverage tax. I think it's a regressive tax that, that we need to end. And I, as far as the convention center expansion, I, I'm all for that. If, if uh, you know, if we want to auction off the convention center to the private sector and let them expand it, or if, if a group of, uh, you know, uh, private sector hotels and restaurants and uh, businesses, you know, that will benefit from it in the private sector, if they want to get together and raise money among themselves and pitch in and, and uh, you know, operate the convention center or expand it, that would be great. Um, but as far as a, a general uh, food and beverage tax that taxes poor people on, you know, everything from fast food to prepared food like rotisserie chickens at the grocery store, I, I think that's just regressive and it's it's a um, basically crony capitalism. And, and I think we we really in, in progressive Bloomington and Monroe County can do better than that. Um, so so uh, and, and really the, the private sector ought to take take if, if there's demand for uh, convention business uh, and, and people want to hold meetings here, then surely the private sector will step up and, if there's a profit opportunity. Uh, to be had there. Uh, the, the other thing I'd say, if, 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 uh, if you're actually, if, if you want to do it with the government, then at least do it through the innkeeper's tax so that visitors are paying for this. And if you have to go, you know, if you have to take it to the legislature to get them to approve uh, a higher innkeeper's tax for this purpose, then take it to the legislature and let them do that. Don't force this food and beverage tax. It's for aggressive food and beverage tax on the residents of Monroe County. That's just, that's just wrong. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Knott. So um, we're hearing you say that um, you, you're opposed to the food and beverage tax, but you're, you're suggesting perhaps if the innkeeper's tax can cover this cost uh, to try that. Um, and you're also talking about using the private sector. Um, do my colleagues have comments or questions for Mr. Knott? I just, um, I, I'm glad that there are some people who are talking about exploring different ways of funding a convention center. And I do think that that's something that it's worthwhile introducing into the conversation. Thank you, Mr. Knott. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Giffins, did you want to add anything? No, I, I completely echo what Commissioner Jones said. Yeah, I think it's a great thing uh, to think about. Absolutely. Good. All right. Excellent. So uh, thank you, Mr. Knott. We appreciate you joining us today. Uh, it looks like we have Charlotte Zitlow. This is the reunion of commissioners past. Good evening, Charlotte. Oh, you're still muted. There you go. We can hear you now. Uh, not quite. They're still unmuted. Nope. They're still muted. Still, I'm just still muted. Okay. Charlotte, you need to unmute yourself. If you go to the bottom left corner, there's something that says mute and unmute. Ah, there she is. There you go. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Hey, okay. good. Thank now you. I was going to say this is a wonderful session, and Mr. Knott had a good made a good point, but I want to say just generally speaking, 
the issue of a convention center. I think that every every business has got a competition. Every business does, and and, and the the uh, convention center for years didn't seem to be going anyplace. And then we we did we really changed things around when we got Tom O'Daniels and you know in those early days, and it's quite quite a bit changed into something useful because for quite a while it wasn't going any place. So it, it was, it's capable, if we believe in what we're doing, and we do have a great deal to offer in this community, a great deal to offer more. I don't want to say anything negative about Terre Haute, but we have a great deal to offer. <laughs> and and I think that, that it, it depends a great deal on how the convention center is managed and how how, how we present ourselves. And, we have to work hard to compete. Every business has to work hard to compete. No business is guaranteed business. But I think that we can reasonably think that we have something to offer here. And I think we need it for, for local organizations as well. So I hope that you continue thinking about this seriously and, and figuring out how to do it. Because you're doing a wonderful job as commissioners, I think. And then, and, and then We've got plenty of time to to continue to beat beat the drum to get it done properly. Great, thank thank you so much for joining us, Charlotte. We appreciate hearing from you, and we always appreciate a compliment. Um, I'll just speak for my colleagues on that one. So we um, we do, and uh, let's see if uh, there's any follow up from my colleagues for you. Wait. I had something and it's disappeared from my mind. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I, I think Charlotte, yes, what you said about Bloomington basically is unique in a lot of ways and that, that we can add, add that as part, part of our competitive edge. Um, yeah. But we also have to stop and think about the fact that sometimes if people are very loyal to where they've been and if somebody gets in there before us, we may not be in a good position to compete. That's all. Right. You go to Terre Haute, you have a great experience. You keep booking yourself there. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I hear that. Um, I think, I think um, you know, one of the things that is incumbent upon us to do is to think about the entire county. And we're in that unique position and that have that unique responsibility to do so. And I think um, we need to make sure that um, we are thinking about economic development outside the city as well as in the city. Um, so as, as county commissioners, we we cover the whole county, including the city and the town of Ellsville and the town of Stein. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I always think that we, we forget that, but yes. Great. So would you would you say that that you you think we should um, hold off on discussions until we are feeling more secure regarding seeing an end to the pandemic? Uh, would you what are your thoughts on that? I think that if you're going to go to head, head, obviously, Mr. These various people have made a point that this should be we should project it to to fl flourish. Obviously, that's that's a given, and that you should figure out how that is, and and what then what the timing is, but not stop, not not do it because it would be it might not be competitive. I'd say this is you have the opportunity to do something competitive, and I also believe, as you know, that the difficult is hard to it takes a little time, and the impossible takes a little longer. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Charlotte. You're awesome. Uh, we so appreciate your your guidance and advice. I'm not sure that was much help, but anyway. <laughs> it is. It's a huge help. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. My my pleasure. All right. Let's see if we have other um, any other hands raised at this moment um, before we go back to Mr. McAfee? Okay, um, so Mr. McAfee, did you have anything you wanted to add? 
I did. I, I, well, it's an honor to follow Charlotte. So thank her for her. I thank her for her comments. Um, I, I do. I want to say um, absolutely. This is a competitive industry. Terre Haute, Fort Wayne, Evansville, South Bend, Hamilton County, Hendricks County. Uh, Hamilton County and Hendricks County have both both built facilities in the last five years. You know, we we are we are out in the street competing with them every day. Talisha and I will put our teams up against them every day. We'll put our community up against them every day, what we have to offer. We just need a facility that hold, will hold the number of people who want to come here in those groups. And, and I couldn't be more confident that we'll make this successful. Um, I do want to give a, uh, there, I know there's somebody on this call that know that's probably forgotten more about this than we'll ever know. Tony Satilli from Four Winds resort is on this call. He's getting ready to retire. Somebody earlier mentioned um, hunting groups and outdoor groups. Four Winds hosts outdoor recreation related groups all year round. Um, we work closely with them. This all works together to benefit the county. So when, so when a group of 150 fishermen are out there holding a two-day tournament and a conference, the, the, the economic benefits of that are, are floating throughout the county. So it's all part of the big tourism industry. Um, you know, when it comes to um, running a facility like this at a profit, um, that's, it's doable, but the History Center, Wonder Lab, and all those civics groups, we, we run this facility like a civic center now. They won't be able to afford to use it. Um, so if we want local not-for-profit groups to be able to use it the way it's currently set up, that's, that's a big part of it. I, I've, I've heard your, your group, uh, you know, everybody talk about how, you know, it ought to be named a civic center. That, that's what we, that's what we want it to be. So if it's, if it's going to be designed and, and built that way, um, it, it'll just be tough to, to make it profitable because of the pricing structure. So I just want to make that point again. Thank you for having this meeting and I promise I won't speak again. That's, that's quite all right. We appreciate you. All right. We appreciate you. Thank you. Okay. I'm having some internet problems. I'm going to go turn my camera off to see if that helps. Um, it looks like we have another um, comment or question from Ms. Pearl. Welcome. Hi, good evening. Um, thanks so much. I don't have a specific position to share, but as everyone was discussing, um, kind of measuring the economic impact of uh, the convention center, some of the things that I wanted to put out there for consideration um, include how Monroe County is a regional hub in many ways. Um, the latest statistics that we have, we have about 16,000 um, individuals that come into the community for work every year or um, on a regular basis. Um, there is a connection to other industries as a gathering place. So we know that um, tech is a growing industry here, life sciences, um, business services is actually a cluster that we've seen opportunity for growth in the future. Um, nonprofits obviously are, um, you know, very vibrant in our community. So having a place to gather and uh, engage with others from their industries is important. Um, and the other consideration when you're measuring economic impact, there are the, um, there's the impact of the direct jobs, such as those that work directly at the convention center. But then there are those that serve the facility itself. Um, you know, those that do building services, that work in the trades, um, not only for the construction, but um, for the ongoing maintenance of that. Um, those employees uh, live in all parts of the community as well as around the region. And um, those employers are based around the region as well. Um, and then the other um, consideration as well is uh, by expanding a center, you can also attract private investment to um, parcels of land around it as well. You know, it can um, create a sort of, I think that's been mentioned earlier in the uh, evening today, that um, essentially you're improving a whole district of the community and it can give a boost to um, businesses around it as well, uh, as well as those that may want to um, develop private parts of land uh, as that part of the community. So I think when taking a look at 
um, the direct benefit, um, we'd also have to take a look at the indirect benefit long term. Great. Thank you. Let's see if there are follow up comments from my colleagues or questions for Ms. Pearl, Bloomington Economic Development Corporation. Yeah, it'd be nice if we could quantify some of that a little bit. Yeah, and um, we have partners in the community that can do that, um, including at IU and others, um, you know, who specialize in quantifying that. So if anyone's interested, we'd be happy to make those connections. Commissioner Jones, anything you wanted to add? Add it this time. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Pearl. Always good to hear from you. All right. Looks like we don't have any other hands raised at this moment. Let's do one more call around to see. Perhaps somebody has heard something tonight that has led them to um, revise their thoughts or to um, add to their thoughts of um, where they were at the beginning of the evening. Um, please share that with us. I'll see if my colleagues have follow-up questions for the community. Um, I've been looking through the Q&A and I think we've addressed most of um, the questions and then we've received all your comments. Um, some really, Some really good comments. Uh, anyone have anything they wanted to add um, from the community? Um, colleagues, did you have a follow-up question for anyone? I don't really have a question. I have a suggestion that it might be worthwhile um, putting the polls on our website and continuing to collect information from them until the end of 2020. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking maybe we could use Facebook as well, maybe just for the written, for the written questions and maybe we could do a, right. like a survey monkey or something for the other, for the first two. That's a good, that's a good idea. That would be um, nice. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and put our, um, uh, Angie, I'm going to take you off screen share and thank you again uh, for taking notes for us. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, put our information back up on the screen. Uh, so if you're watching this um, on CATS after the 16th of November, or if you've attended today, um, you know, and, and, you know, wow, we've, We've learned a lot uh, today, and we really um, do appreciate everyone um, for being here and sharing uh, some ideas. And um, it's interesting to think about all of these ideas, sort of putting them all together and thinking about um, what we do next and, and what happens next. Um, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to see if there are additional questions or follow-up questions you all have. I don't have a question, but I would like to comment. Um, no, I've been... I, I just... Go ahead. I No, go ahead. I have such a lag time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been at times looking to see who the participants are, and, and it's kind of, it's shifted. So we've had um, well over 60 different people in the community um, tune in and give us suggestions. I want to thank all those people for participating, for being thoughtful in their suggestions. It's been very just civil. Um, and I really appreciate that about our community. Yeah. Yes, that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Just thank you so much to everyone who took time out this evening to join us and give us your ideas and, and please continue to do so because we're going to be collecting these ideas for a while. Yep, 
Absolutely. And, and um, you know, stay engaged and, and keep us posted. And so we'll keep our this email address, ccr at co.monroe.in.us. We'll leave this email address open through at least the end of 2020. So if something that was said today sparks um, a thought for you or an idea, share it with us. We'd love to hear it. Um, and it has been fabulous to hear from a lot of different parts of the community. Uh, we know not everybody can attend a Zoom meeting on a Monday night, but we appreciate that you've taken the time um, and provided some really thoughtful comments and ideas for us. It's been really great to have this conversation. Um, I would ask Ms. Dayton if you would please copy and paste the Q&A comments into a, um, into a Word doc or an email and send it to us. That would be great so that we don't miss anything. Um, and uh, let's see if there's just one more go around, if there's anyone else that has anything they wish to share. Looks like we have one hand, uh, Jay Murphy. Great. Mr. Murphy, welcome back. I, I will keep this brief. I know it's running late. Um, the, the conversation about the number of jobs that will be hired in a community based on the expanded command center and hotel. That information is in uh, the Hunden report that was done. And I know you've seen that and I just want to mention that. I know Ms. Pearl mentioned uh, using any adverb, which would be wonderful to do, but we have a plethora of information already on hand that although it will need to be revised. Just want you to be aware yeah. of that. Yeah. I think that's the key, Mr. Murphy, is we will have to revise it. And I think one of the questions that I know has come up throughout all of this is, is what kind of jobs are they? And yes, there are some trade jobs, but you know, if, if most of the jobs are uh, minimum wage or sub-minimum wage serving jobs, then that is that economic development. Um, that's the big question. Um, and are the businesses uh, locally owned or are they corporately owned where the profits leave the community, um, which benefit, right? So I know it's there's a, um, a business development aspect to this as well. So um, yeah, it's a really good point that we do that we do need to um, uh, we do need to come back and um, and look at those job numbers, uh, economic development numbers again, um, sort of in that post COVID uh, mindset. So that's a great that's a great point. Thank you. All right, it seems like we're winding down. <laughs> All right, any other um, comments or questions from anyone here? Um, and Ms. Dayton, if you could um, post the poll results again for us and send us those as well on email later, that would be fabulous. Um, Ms. Dayton, you've been amazing. Um, yeah, so here are our poll results. So it looks like we haven't changed anybody's minds over the last two or three years. I don't think any minds have been changed. So people that didn't support it now support it. That's interesting. It's interesting to see that. All right. And an interest in either proceeding or not proceeding, split vote on that. Okay. Great. Uh, anyone have anything else they want to add, my colleagues? Nope. All right, excellent. Thank you. So again, thanks, huge thanks from all of us to the community. Thank you, Ms. Purdy. Thank you, Ms. Dayton as well. Uh, thanks to everyone in the community for participating. We've learned a lot from you and um, as you consider things, please come back to ccr at co.monroe.in.us and send us your, your thoughts. All right. So with that, we'll conclude the meeting. Thanks, everyone.